So uh, as Karen kindly mentioned, uh, my name is Julian. I lead the blockchain and digital assets practice, uh, which is a, a industry focused practice group uh, cutting across uh, all areas of functional areas of the law. So uh, including uh, financial regulatory uh, licensing questions, uh, the uh, disputes, which has there's been a lot of lately, uh, insolvency and so forth. Okay, just a list of accolades. And just quickly through that portion and to part you're really interested in. Uh, so we're gonna, I'm gonna start with a quick overview. Now this is um, somewhat basic, I think for, for many of the crypto native lawyers in Singapore, uh, you'll be very familiar with everything I'm about to say. Uh, but of course, since we have a much wider audience, I, I do want to kind of like go over some of the uh, uh, basics. So Singapore's approach uh, is uh, to, to, to regulating the blockchain space uh, has been um, a, a very technologically agnostic one, uh, where the focus has been on the actual nature of the activities being conducted, uh, as opposed to the nomenclature, whether it's uh, traditional, uh, fintech, or blockchain, Web3, whatever you want to call it, uh, the local regulators in Singapore will, will want to drill through to the underlying fundamentals of what it is you're doing. Uh, that, I think, is, is, is largely down to the fact that uh, Singapore has one primary regulator that has authority to regulate over all these jurisdictions. Uh, that is the Monetary Authority of Singapore. And so the, the MAS has jurisdiction uh, over you, whether you're a security, whether you're a commodity, or you know, whether you're in the financial space or not. Uh, and and this, this is in stark distinction uh, with, you know, I think the classic example is the US with, dueling, uh, with the dueling S uh, uh, SEC and CFTC. So there's no, there's as much less concern over um, te technical uh, nomenclature or taxonomy and a much greater focus on the substance. So the primary regulations we have in Singapore uh, the uh, Securities and Futures Act, which like every other country, Singapore has a, uh, has, has a law on um, what we call a capital markets product in Singapore. There's also currently the Payment Services Act. Um, and the, these are the two main uh, currently uh, enforced acts uh, that, uh, that regulate uh, the uh, blockchain space in Singapore. In addition, uh, the Payment Services Act has a, a substantial amendment that we'll cover. Uh, that is not currently yet in effect. Uh, as well as the, uh, there's also a Financial Services and Markets Act, uh, which has, and these have all been passed in Parliament, but not yet in effect. Uh, we'll, we'll cover um, all of these. So, So before before I before I go into the uh, the Payment Services Act, uh, let me just uh, say a few words about the the, uh, the applicability of the Securities and Futures Act uh, to in, in the crypto domain. Um, so as you might expect, uh, the the Act regulates uh, things which are securities. Uh, the question then, uh, you know, what what is in the remit of what is a security? And one thing I'll mention here is that Singapore doesn't have a catch-all investment contract category, and so there isn't. Uh, a, a, a Howey test equivalent uh, where you look through uh, and, and construe an item as a, as a security. So to the Payment Services Act. Now, the, the Payment Services Act came into force uh, in January 2020 uh, and uh, it, was, it originated from the, the previous uh, Payment Services Oversight Act uh, and the uh, Money Changing and Remittance Business Act. There we are. So that gives you some context, right? So, so uh, when the act was being drafted, uh, the world of crypto was largely dominated by things like Bitcoin and Ether. You know, things that things that constitute that that are primarily used as means of payment. And so the uh, the, the regulatory mindset was, of course, to then shoehorn it in, in together with other payment means. And so the Payment Services Act regulates. Uh, you know, people who conduct activity, businesses in account issuance, uh, issuance of e-money, uh, electronic money, um, money transfer, whether domestic cross-border, uh, money changing. And so then they added digital payment tokens, right? So this is not a, a, a all-encompassing crypto regulation. It's specific to, uh, 
to a certain class of tokens uh, defined in the act as digital payment tokens. So what are digital payment tokens? The definition in the act is that they're a digital payment uh, of uh, the digital representation of value that's expressed as a unit that's not denominated or pegged to any currency. It's and is, is or is intended to be a medium of exchange accepted by the public that can be transferred, stored, or traded electronically. There's, a, there's also a catch-all, uh, as is typical in Singapore legislation. Say it, it's also uh, a, 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 a token that satisfies other characteristics as the M MAS may prescribe from time to time. And that gives the MAS a flexibility uh, to, to adjust the definition uh, as, 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 as the market and industry evolves uh, without the need to go back to parliament. Uh, today, as of today, there are no such other characteristics. So you can kind of read it out the definition. So the Act regulates activities in DBTs, but also not all. So first of all, I mean, as I was mentioning, right, the, the Act doesn't regulate all tokens, only tokens that are digital payment tokens. Uh, in addition, it doesn't regulate all activities in digital payment tokens. There's a limited list of services uh, which, uh, in, which, are, which engage in relation to DBTs uh, will, will, you know, for, there's, a, there's a licensing requirement uh, to get a license if you engage in those services. So as of today, the, the Payment Services Act has a relatively limited list of uh, two services, dealing in DPTs and facilitating the exchange of DPTs. Uh, they've also excluded uh, the um, dealing in limited purpose DPTs, which is a defined term uh, for, you know, kind of like tokens which would otherwise be considered DPTs, uh, but, not, but not widely traded, uh, are not tradable to the public. Uh, or central bank DBT. So, you know, MES had, had already foreseen uh, CBDCs uh, when, uh, when the PS Act was being drafted. So dealing in DBTs simply means buying and selling of DBTs in exchange for money, right? Uh, MES has indicated that buying has, has indicated that their approach or, or their position is that buying or selling of DBTs, including your own DBT, so ICOs for instance, uh, would be considered a DPT service and therefore something which requires a license. Uh, I would note that there's been a recent case uh, in the Supreme Court uh, which held that uh, buying or selling of crypto uh, on your own for, for your own accord uh, is not considered uh, a DPT service under the Act. Uh, so we'll have to see how that, that line of case law uh, evolves uh, and how MAS's understanding of, uh, of, of the dealing with DPT's provision evolves. The second class of, of license activities is facilitating the exchange of DPT's and that's, you know, it's a defined term in the Act. Uh, it's not as wide as the plain language says, uh, the term is defined to mean uh, establishing or operating a DPT exchange, uh, which is then defined as a centralized place where offers or invitations to buy or sell DPTs are regularly made. So the license activity is establishing a G DPT exchange where the operator of the exchange comes in possession of money or DPTs. Right? Uh, so astute uh, crypto participants will quickly realize uh, that decentralized exchanges and, and P2P platforms uh, fall out of this definition uh, because they don't take possession of the money or the, or the DPTs. So that's, so we'll come to that. That's that, 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 that um, loophole, for want of a better word, uh, is, is, is being closed. So if you conduct one of these activities, uh, i.e. dealing in DPTs or running a centralized uh, DPT exchange, uh, you will need to apply for a license under the Payment Services Act. Uh, and there are two main classes of license, a uh, standard or major payment institution license. And the, uh, th these are primarily determined uh, by the threshold of a volume of activity on your exchange. Okay. I won't go through the details of, of, of the uh, application conditions. So there are uh, a variety of limitations uh, that have been imposed on uh, uh, licensees and applicants in Singapore. 
uh, then, and many of these have been introduced over time through guidelines and, and notices from the MAS. So for instance, uh, the, uh, the, these licensed exchanges are, are prohibited from uh, granting credit facilities to individuals in Singapore. Uh, since, um, well, since Monday, <laughs> um, the, uh, the MS has also, also uh, about, uh, indicated that it will introduce uh, restrictions on uh, lending or staking of retail customers' assets by the exchanges. Uh, the uh, exchanges are prohibited from marketing or advertising the services in public areas through third parties. Uh, they're required to provide risk warnings uh, to, to their users. Uh, and they're also required, uh, they're also prohibited from uh, promoting paper, payment token derivative contracts to the public uh, as a alternative to trading in DPTs. Uh, this is a bit of an odd point, and, and, and let, me, let me just kind of like um, talk about this for a moment. Uh, derivatives in general under Singapore law are, are regulated as securities under the Securities and Futures Act. However, the, uh, the, the, the government has taken position uh, that derivatives of payment tokens, so Bitcoin, your, your Bitcoin derivatives, for instance, uh, will not uh, administratively be treated as a security. Uh, they equally are not payment tokens themselves. Uh, so today, uh, crypto option trading falls outside the Securities and Futures Act and also falls outside the Payment Services Act. Uh, hence, the need to prohibit uh, crypto exchanges from uh, promoting uh, this avenue of, of, of going through uh, crypto options uh, as a method of not trading with a license exchange. Okay. So let's quick run through the currently enforced Payment Services Act. Uh, moving to the Amendment Act. So, so when the, the, the Act was launched, uh, as I mentioned, uh, came into effect in, in, in early 2020, uh, and within the short span of a year, uh, the MAS had quickly realized that it needed to scope in uh, quite a bit more in the way of crypto activities in the market. Uh, so the, so the Payment Services Amendment Act uh, was, was, uh, was, passed, was passed in Parliament, and it scopes in uh, additional activities which will be regulated, uh, for which uh, you know, you'll need a license if you engage them. Uh, the, the Amendment Act is not yet in effect, and we don't, we don't have a target date when it will become in effect. Uh, but when it does come into effect, the additional services are primarily custody, uh, active facilitation of the exchange of DPTs, and facilitating the transfer of DPTs. Uh, Useful to note for anyone uh, planning to uh, who, who engages in these uh, activities is that there will be a transitional period uh, whereby uh, participants who are already conducting these uh, these activities uh, will be able to continue conducting their services uh, pending the application process. Uh, this uh, it you know it's, this is a traditional grandfathering in concept, but it has turned it turned out to be of enormous importance. Uh, with regard to the Payment Services Act, which was, as mentioned, in, in effect, as in February, uh, in, in February 2020, uh, because uh, a large number of the people who had applied uh, at that time are still pending the applications three years later. Uh, so, so this, this, despite the fact that in the in the original act, you know, the, the grandfathering period was envisaged to be around six months or so, uh, it's been uh, it's turned out to be much longer. And uh, as the um, uh, as, as, as I think the, you know, once the pay Amendment Act comes into effect and, and MAS grapples with uh, what are appropriate standards uh, for applicants, uh, it, you, you might anticipate that you know, it will take some time uh, for uh, an evaluation of uh, good players uh, to come through. So the expanded scope. Uh, we talked earlier about um, uh, centralized exchanges being, uh, being, being subject to the act as it stands and, and decentralized exchanges not. Uh, so the, the, active facilitate, the, new, the new regulated activity under the Amendment Act of active facilitation is primarily intended to cover uh, this scope. Uh, anyone who conducts a service of inducing or attempting to induce any person uh, into, a, into a crypto trade um, whether or not the uh, whether or not the um, uh, the platform or the or the operator uh, comes into possession of the DPT or money, 
uh, you know, that will be a regulated activity. There's also a, a new regulated activity. There, there will also be a new regulated activity of facilitating the transfer of DBTs. Uh, so uh, any anyone who accepts a service, um, whether as principle uh, of accepting uh, digital payment tokens uh, to arrange for their transmission or transfer uh, as a payment system, uh, will be will be regulated. Uh, the this we spend some time thinking about who in the crypto regime is, is covered by this space. I think it's, you know, largely seems to be targeted at traditional remittance providers like WISE or, or Western Union. Um, we'll see. Uh, I think there is a, a conceivable argument that bridging services might be caught under the, uh, the, the plain language of the statute. I'm not sure that was the intent, uh, but reading the plain language of the provision, it does it, it may capture that, so it's something to think about. Means, it? Absolutely, and and that term is not defined in the act. So I think I think you know as um, as we come closer to the amendment act uh, coming into effect, uh, I think questions like this are, are going to have to be answered. Custody. I think this 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 is kind of the big one. Um, so anyone who provides a service of safeguarding a digital payment token um, where the service provider has control over the DPT uh, is it, going to be regarded as providing custody service and therefore require a license. Uh, the, um, the question is, what does control mean? Uh, and you know, in, this, in this particular sense, um, uh, the definition also covers uh, that where, where the uh, service provider has control over the digital payment token instrument, which is also a defined term. So they define the term as uh, anyone who has control over a password, cipher, code, cipher, cryptogram. You can read that. Uh, and and MAS has uh, taken a position that control need not be absolute or exclusive. right? So, so where we're getting to is that uh, if you hold uh, one or more of the keys to a multi-sig wallet, uh, will you be regarded as having control over that wallet and therefore providing a custody service, notwithstanding, of course, that, that you, don't, you can't actually transfer the... I mean, in, in ordinary parlance, we consider control uh, to, be, uh, to be the ability to actually transfer the crypto, right? So if, if I hold the crypto on your behalf and I have the ability to take it away, uh, then you know I clearly have control. Uh, if I've got, uh, you know, MAS has taken the position that uh, negative control, I think, would be control. So if I have, if it's a, um, a, a two or three multi-sig, uh, well, if it's two or three, well, let's say it's a four or five multi-sig, and I held two, uh, two of the keys, I would have negative control. I would have, I would have the ability to prevent you from transferring the tokens. I think. Uh, MAS's indication would be that that would constitute control. Uh, the difficult question becomes, what if I have one of the five keys in a four or five multi-sig? Uh, so we're going to have to, that's also a question we're going to have to address what because... About well? Exactly. Uh, so so to, to echo to that, to, to people who have, haven't, who weren't able to hear because of Mike, uh, what about shards for MBC? You know, further and newer technologies to uh, to, to, to decentralize control over keys and to uh, avoid abuse are going to get scoped in intentionally or unintentionally. And so these are uh, you know, questions that are going to have to be dealt with uh, as we come closer uh, to, to uh, the amendment that come into effect. Okay. So moving on we, uh, to, to another piece of legislation, the Financial Services and Markets Act. One, one thing that's, I guess, uh, surprising, I think, to anyone coming from, uh, uh, coming from the US, in particular, with its extraterritoriality, is that Singapore regulation is primarily territorial. And so the regulation, the laws, apply to activities conducted in Singapore. The Securities and Futures Act applies to activities, securities activities in Singapore. The Payment Services Act applies to the provision of payment services in Singapore. And so, 
one thing that has happened over the years is a number of service providers have set up in Singapore and then blocked activity in Singapore. So they're incorporated in Singapore, they operate from Singapore, but they don't offer their services to persons in Singapore. And, and this, as a question, um, uh, you know, was, was taken up by the FEDAF in 2019 and the FSMA in Singapore primarily addressed uh, at uh, um, addressing the concerns raised by the FF and recommendations raised by the FEDF. So the two groups of service providers will be regulated under the FSMA. There are uh, entities offering digital token services outside of Singapore from a place in Singapore and any Singapore company carrying on a business or providing a digital token service anywhere in the world. Uh, the scope of the regulation uh, is you know, kind of like largely to introduce uh, licensing and AML, uh, anti-money laundering and, and counter-terrorism financing uh, requirements similar to those that are imposed under, the, uh, imposed under the Payment Services Act. One interesting thing to note is that the FSMA does not contain a grandfathering or transitional, uh, transitional period uh, provision. Uh, so when it comes into effect, it will come into effect instantly. That's, that's how the act is written. Um, the act will come into effect upon a publication of a notice in the Government Gazette in Singapore. Uh, administratively, of course, it's also possible to, to state that uh, the act will come into effect at a later date. Uh, and so you know, everyone who might otherwise be scoped in does receive advance notice. Uh, but none of that is present in the act as it stands today. I think we've talked about this. Uh, the scope of the FSMA is interestingly a little wider than the Payment Services Act. Uh, it covers digital tokens, so you know, another new term. Uh, uh, and digital tokens are wider than digital payment tokens as set out in the Payment Services Act. It, it, it means both the DPTs as well as digital representations of capital markets products, so i.e. security tokens. Uh, so again, the MAS is being uh, very forward-looking uh, and and you know kind of envisaging the growth of uh, you know real world asset tokens security tokens uh, and scoping them in under the FSMA. Okay. So to summarize, um, the the current regime in Singapore uh, for anyone operating in Singapore is to is is to look at both the secu traditional Securities and Futures Act uh, as well as the Payment Services Act. Uh, and in terms of the upcoming regime, there will be the, uh, the wider scope under the Payment Services Amendment Act um, and the uh, Financial Services and Markets Act. I think it's fair to say that um, uh, compared to, many, jurisdiction, to, compared to uh, many other jurisdictions in the world, uh, Singapore has been um, very forward-looking and very uh, fast-moving in terms of, as regulators go, uh, in terms of catching up with uh, um, where the uh, blockchain and Web3 space has been going. Uh, and and uh, there's been uh, great attention uh, paid to uh, understanding the underlying technology uh, and uh, understanding what is being done with the underlying technology and figuring out how to regulate it appropriately. And I think we can continue to see that going forward. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm uh, Masayuki Tani. Uh, thank you for coming to this uh, event, Singapore Crypto Law Meetup. So I'm uh, very delighted to introduce a uh, regulatory landscape of digital talks in Japan here. So uh, I will uh, briefly uh, explain my, about myself. So I am a, a Japanese uh, qualified lawyer and uh, I'm have founded a uh, uh, Pro Innovation Legal, which is a, a Japanese law firm uh, focusing on digital innovation. And uh, uh, my main focus at the current moment is uh, Web3 and uh, crypto. I'm a yeah, crypto native or DGEN. So yeah, uh, I will start the presentation yeah, from the table of contents. So, First, uh, yeah, I assume 
uh, not many people are not familiar with the Japanese uh, event in detail or like uh, uh, registr legislative development. So I start from the history and uh, move to the uh, key concept and the statutes. And uh, uh, on the sec uh, third part, uh, I will explain a brief uh, introduction of each category of uh, uh, regulation. So next, okay. Yes, this uh, is a, a timeline. So first, uh, in 2014, the Mount Gox incident happened. So uh, before that, uh, Japanese uh, regulation uh, had uh, no concept of a uh, crypto asset or equivalent. But uh, after that, the uh, uh, Japanese government noticed that a uh, kind of a regulation uh, is uh, necessary. Also, uh, in 2015, uh, Elmao G7 summit mentioned the necessity of uh, AML. So uh, in the discussion, uh, after the Mount Gox and the, the summit, uh, the uh, Payment Services Act was uh, amended to introduce a registration for crypto exchanges uh, for the customer protection and AML. So, uh, and uh, in 2017, uh, the, the law was uh, amended, but uh, in 2018, uh, Name tokens were hacked uh, at the CoinCheck exchange uh, by a phishing attack uh, from a cold wallet. So uh, in the event, or through the event, uh, two risks, two risks uh, are recognized. First, uh, risk of uh, holding crypto asset in cold wallet uh, connected to the internet. Uh, the second, uh, risk of insolvency of the exchanges. So in response to the event, uh, the Payment Service Act was uh, again revised to introduce uh, the more uh, protective measures. So I will explain uh, the, the point later. Uh, but uh, yeah, around 2021, uh, a different trend comes. Uh, as you know, uh, NFT uh, got popular, and uh, in the past, uh, BTC trading or uh, crypto trading were not very like uh, supported by the government. Uh, but the uh, NFTs are uh, like uh, uh, the government uh, are getting interested in NFTs for the purpose of uh, uh, industrial uh, development. So. Uh, Japanese ruling party, uh, uh, liberal democratic party, and also uh, economic uh, uh, part of the Japanese government uh, got involved in the regulation. So uh, on, after that, in 2022, uh, NFT white paper uh, was uh, issued. Also, uh, the next year, the continuous, in the continuous discussion, uh, Web3 white paper was uh, published. Also, yeah, in June uh, 2022, uh, the basic policy on economic and fiscal management and reform 2022, which is the, one of the most basic uh, governmental uh, policy statement, uh, uh, committed to uh, fostering an environment for Web3 DAOs. Uh, metaverse and uh, security tokens. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, as a, uh, sorry, uh, consequently, uh, in 2023, corporate tax on unrealized gain from crypto asset, which was uh, too much burden for, for uh, the crypto business, was uh, partly abolished. I will explain later. And the uh, regulation of stable coins took effect. Uh, yeah, so this is the uh, rough timeline. So I will uh, move to next. So key statutes and the concept. So uh, we have uh, two 
uh, main statute relevant to the uh, crypto regulation. First is the uh, uh, Financial Instruments and the Exchange Act. So this is the uh, uh, statute covering uh, the basic financial regulation, like uh, stocks, uh, debt, or like uh, any derivatives. So, uh, and the security uh, is regulated by this uh, act. So, when digital talks are regarded as securities, yeah, it's a Japanese law, uh, there is a kind of a catch all uh, security uh, definition, which is called the uh, collective investment scheme. And uh, the three conditions, all of the three conditions are fulfilled. So uh, that will be regarded as a security. So first, investment or, or contribution of money. Okay. Uh, second, the business is conducted using the money. Yeah, these two are some obvious, but uh, the three, third, the business income or the proceed from the disposal of the business is distributed to the investor or contributor of the money. So, uh, uh, when you uh, return some money or some value to the investor, so this will probably be regarded as a security. But uh, otherwise, that will not be regarded as security. So this is uh, uh, not the same as uh, the definition in the US. Uh, generally, it, it's narrower. So, uh, and the uh, electrically recorded transferable rights to be indicated uh, on securities, it's a very long uh, jargon. But uh, if a digital tokens are regarded as a security, so this uh, word is used in the uh, act. And uh, yeah, this is, uh, uh, and uh, also, yeah, uh, derivatives of crypto asset are regulated under the uh, Financial Instrument and Exchange Act. So uh, I will move to the second one, uh, Payment Services Act. This uh, defined uh, and regulated crypto assets. So definition is a uh, long, so uh, I prepare a diagram on definition of crypto asset. So uh, first property value, which is recorded on an electronic device. Yes, oh, uh, that's a basic. And uh, the second can be transferred by means of electronic data processing system. Yes, that, that's also uh, basic. Uh, the third, excluding the Japanese currency, foreign currency, and currency denominated asset. That's because uh, stable coins, fiat-based stable coins are categorized as stable coins, and regulated as a stable coins separately. So, uh, and with uh, unspecified persons acting as counterparties can be used for the purpose of paying consideration. So, uh, this is a key element of the definition. So, uh, because uh, the Payment Service Act regulates uh, cryptocurrencies, element of a pay in uh, purpose of paying consideration is uh, required. Required. Yeah, and uh, the below that can also be purchased from an, uh, and sold. That's in the similar to the above. So, if all of these elements are satisfied, so uh, that is regarded as the crypto assets in item one. Yeah, uh, in that slide, yeah, item one. So, and uh, the right side, yeah, can be mutually exchanged with the crypto asset in item one. This is uh, ambiguous. Uh, however, uh, it is uh, interpreted by the financial service agency that the uh, uh, element of uh, our economic function as a means as a means of payment is required uh, for satisfying the right side of the uh, requirement. So uh, generally it's uh, not easy to, not straightforward, but uh, um, I would like to mention that or highlight that uh, payment, element of payment consideration is required uh, for crypto assets. 
Yes, so uh, next I will uh, move to other uh, concept uh, in the PSA. Uh, first is electronic payment instrument, uh, which is uh, generally a fiat back stable coin uh, introduced uh, in, in June this year. So, uh, and, uh, but uh, algorithmic uh, stable coins are categorized as crypto asset. So only uh, fiat back the stable coins are regarded as stab stable coins. And the uh, second prepaid payment instrument, this is a uh, uh, prepaid card, generally for like, a, for example, coffee or services. Uh, but uh, in the context of crypto, uh, sometimes in-game coins without refunds can be categorized as a prepaid payment instrument. So uh, I will move to overview by application business area. So one by one. Yeah, first, uh, uh, crypto asset exchange services providers. Uh, this is uh, generally, for example, exchanges or like a, a OTC trade. So uh, the definition of crypto asset exchange service uh, is uh, carrying out any of the following at, in the course of trade. In the course of trade is a uh, kind of jargon in Japanese law. Uh, it means that generally in business or as business. So uh, yeah, if uh, one of the four uh, category, uh, so uh, you need to take the uh, you need to register as a crypto asset exchange service providers. So first, a uh, purchase and sale of crypto asset as a business. Yes. Uh, the second, intermediary brokerage or agency service. Uh, third, management of users' money uh, for the purchase or intermediary of cryptocurrency. Uh, and uh, the fourth, management of crypto assets on behalf of another person. Yeah, uh, this uh, covers a custodial wallet or a custodial staking service or sometimes application which implement a kind of a staking uh, in, onto the service. And uh, I will explain uh, the measure for protection of users asset uh, introduced after the name incident. So first, uh, users, about users' cash. So all deposited cash from users shall be managed in trust by a trust bank or trust company. Uh, so, uh, and the users' crypto asset. So I prepared uh, the kind of uh, explanation. So uh, on the left side, uh, so more than 95% of the user's asset should be stored in cold wallet. And uh, less than 5% uh, can be stored in hot wallet for daily operation. However, uh, if the exchange store a uh, certain percentage of a uh, uh, token in hot wallet, so the same amount of tokens should be uh, stored in the cold wallet as the exchanges on asset. So uh, it means 100% uh, of the <coughs> asset uh, user's token uh, stored in cold wallet. And uh, also the above users have a right to receive in preference uh, as a st statutory lien over all of assets in the three box. So uh, legal rights are pro provided also. So, uh, this is a, a strict uh, consumer protection, and it also uh, it's also a burden for crypto exchanges in Japan. Next, so how about fundraising by issuing digital tokens? So, yeah, uh, as a consequence of the last slide, the 
this uh, definition of uh, the activity uh, to sell fungible tokens to Japanese residents legally. The protocol must use a registered exchange. Uh, and uh, yeah, and uh, in reality, some IOs were conducted in Japan already. And uh, the next, uh, dividends and profit distribution to token holders may make them securities. So, uh, yeah, but uh, if uh, uh, the tokens are structured uh, not to fall into securities, so IOs uh, can be put, can be uh, conducted in Japan. So next, uh, how about NFTs? So if NFT has an economic function as a means of payment, the NFT is regarded as a crypto asset. So you need to sell through a, a registered exchange. But otherwise, uh, to sell NFTs uh, are not regulated in principle. So, uh, so what is the conditions? Uh, so these are to ensure that a certain NFT doesn't fall under the category of crypto assets. Uh, first, uh, clarify the issuer's intent to prohibit using the NFT as a means of payment. It means that uh, in T and C, uh, you state uh, or don't use this token as a uh, for the payment. Uh, so that is not a high hurdle. Number two, number of NFTs and the price of each NFT are set as being not suitable as a means of payment. Uh, and uh, recently, the FSA uh, published the views uh, that yeah, if uh, the minimum indivisible uh, unit is uh, less than one million, or uh, the minimum unit is uh, traded uh, higher than Japanese uh, and 1,000 Japanese yen, which uh, the amount to less than 10 Singapore dollar now. So uh, if uh, either of these uh, uh, price condition or uh, amount condition, uh, number number of uh, issuance condition, so that is uh, in principle uh, not suitable as a means of payment. So this helps a uh, lot uh, cooperation in uh, pre planning uh, NFT project. And as I said, the NFTs are in reality not used as a means of payment. This is uh, this condition is uh, provided uh, for prohibiting evasion of uh, regulation. So uh, uh, minor usage of uh, NFT for payment is not considered uh, here. So, uh, so, so in, in total, uh, the standard for or like uh, uh, the line between NFTs and the crypto assets are uh, clear. So. Mm. Yes, the next. So corporate tax on unrealized profit from crypto asset. Mm. This was a huge hurdle for any aspect of a crypto uh, business. So first, so, so I will explain. Uh, so a corporation holding crypto asset, for example, yeah, a corporation hold BTC or some uh, uh, other tokens, uh, which are traded in equity market, uh, need to pay corporate tax on unrealized profits from crypto assets at the business, the corporation's business year. So uh, uh, for issuers, for example, uh, the issuers, uh, generally startups, uh, they want to fundraise by issuing token. However, uh, they sell a certain percentage of uh, tokens, uh, but uh, they need to uh, pay 
corporate tax on all of the tokens they hold. So it almost prohibits fundraising by issuing tokens. The second, for the beast BC, uh, they hold token, uh, but uh, sometimes cannot sell the tokens uh, for the due to the lockup arrangement. So that also uh, uh, promote BCs to go to foreign countries. And the third, so holding BTC is uh, by corporation for a long time. It's like a, so um, micro strategy uh, or cannot be cannot survive in Japan. So, uh, but uh, for the first one, uh, this yeah uh, encourage ambitious Japanese founder to move to foreign country. This uh, was a criticize the and the Japanese uh, political party discussed seriously and uh, the amended uh, they amended uh, the uh, system of uh, corporate tax on unreal profit uh, uh, just for issuers. Uh, the issuer means uh, 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 issuing the corporation, but uh, for the Japanese CFC rule, uh, it, it uh, means uh, Japanese founders, uh, uh, individual founders, uh, does not necessarily move to foreign country after, sorry, uh, after 2023, uh, April. Uh, And uh, NFT seven gambling profits, uh, gambling act. So uh, this uh, issue was uh, discussed frequently in Japan, uh, especially by corporation of, it, of which are interested in NFTs. So first, uh, selling NFTs utilizes randomness can raise concerns related to gambling laws. So. Yeah, as she, uh, as mentioned in the, oh, okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, for example, uh, if you pay certain amount, uh, for example, 100 USDC, and get uh, some NFT with uh, some rarity, uh, like uh, caps or uh, sunglasses. So, uh, and uh, the price, uh, depends on the reality of the futures, uh, sunglasses. Or like. So uh, that can be considered as a gambling. And uh, the second, the risk is perceived to be higher if the seller of the NFT is uh, involved in the operation of pricing within the secondary market. So yeah, uh, on this uh, uh, topic, uh, in the study group of the Japanese ruling party uh, discussed and also uh, leading a criminal lawyer uh, uh, published a paper on this issue and uh, yeah uh, this is the analysis uh, but uh, they are moving to um, clarify that uh, yeah other cases yeah Without involvement in the without the involvement in the operation or pricing within the secondary market by the issuer or relevant parties, uh, that will not constitute uh, the gambling activities. And that's a third point. The Web three white paper highlights the need for guidelines uh, to clarify this issue. Okay. And the uh, Another topic is a legal wrapper for DAO. So first, I will uh, talk about the picture. So Yamakoshi DAO and Nishiki Goi NFT. So the system is, uh, oh, so Yamakoshi is a, a small village uh, in a country side of Japan. Uh, they are promoting uh, their village uh, with uh, NFT by selling NFT and uh, creating DAO. Uh, this these uh, movements are supported by the government. 
uh, so uh, DAO uh, generally uh, thought as a positive man, positive things. So uh, there is a candidate for DAOs at, the, uh, at this moment. So partnership uh, is uh, yeah uh, can give a flexible governance structure. However, uh, this uh, doesn't uh, give a uh, uh, limited liability. Uh, the second, general incorporated association or foundation. Yeah, this uh, gives you limited liability, but uh, uh, under the statutory uh, provisions, uh, governance uh, cannot be flexible. Uh, so uh, the third one, an incorporated association, this was uh, created by a case uh, of a Supreme Court uh, and uh, not statutory, statutory provisions. Uh, but uh, this, this can be uh, the best candidate at this moment. However, uh, the charter should be carefully drafted uh, because that is a best of uh, Supreme Court case. So the first one, LLC, uh, this is a, a kind of corporation uh, in, under Company Act in Japan. So, however, uh, at this moment, the information of uh, members should be registered uh, the public registry. Uh, so, it may conflict with the system of uh, transfer of ownership by tokens. So, uh, now the Web3 white paper uh, proposed uh, amending LLC law uh, to be more supportive of DAO. Okay. Uh, next, DeFi. So now uh, no specific DeFi regulation exists, but the traditional financial rules may apply. Um, and uh, a study group in the FSA is exploring how DeFi should be regulated. And uh, in the explanatory material issued by the FSA, uh, trust point uh, discuss. Trust points are, for example, uh, the lab companies or uh, custodial wallets. Uh, Etc. So I cannot uh, say much about this DeFi because uh, they are uh, in the middle of a discussion. But uh, I can say that uh, they are aware of risks and the merits of DeFi well. So and uh, some uh, they uh, had they uh, conducted a hearing of a DeFi project, uh, including Uniswap or Japanese. Uh, DeFi companies or system engineers. So uh, they are open uh, to further discussions. Oh, uh, just, oh stable coins. So now uh, no stable coins, including USDC, USDT, USDT are traded uh, in uh, Japanese registered exchange uh, because of the lack of uh, registration. However, uh, recently, uh, stable coins registration took effect, uh, and the announcement of issuing and utilizing stable coins were made. So on the left, uh, Japanese uh, uh, big financial group of banks uh, listed, and also NTT and uh, JPX. Uh, JPX is a uh, uh, yeah, uh, Japanese Tokyo Stock, uh, operating Tokyo Stock Exchange. So uh, these are mm, in as these are coordinated to create a uh, infrastructure infra uh, of a program which is named program uh, and uh, uh, they in the announcement the, each bank will issue uh, stable coins uh, possibly. But uh, they uh, will start uh, issuing uh, stable coins on consortium chain uh, 
according to the announcement. And the, on the right side, uh, so uh, in the next phase, uh, they will, the Japanese company will issue uh, stable coins uh, in, on public blockchains. And uh, the project for uh, exchanging or bridging uh, Japanese stable coins to various uh, public blockchains uh, also uh, reportedly announced, uh, uh, launched. So that's all. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, that's my Twitter, Telegram, email. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, I'm Ruben Consensio. I'm head of uh, Asian markets from uh, Everlasting. So we're a digital asset uh, custody uh, management platform, right? And um, here to talk to you a little about how we see the change in uh, custody of assets moving forward. Standard disclaimer, this is not legal or financial advice. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right, fantastic. So since the dawn of time, man has always wondered how we're going to accumulate more assets. And more importantly, once we've accumulated them, how do we secure it and pass it on to the next generation? This is a problem that has not changed. And now with this revolutionary digital asset class that's come up, we're thinking about it again, right? How do we actually pass on our wealth or secure it and ensure that it is moved according to our wishes so that our trust is never misplaced? So the way we are seeing the problem is this, it should be about designated custody, having the power to decide exactly who, where, when can actually move the asset and it is guaranteed by the technology. So I'm sure you've heard this all before, right? So I'm just gonna move forward first. Now, why it's so important is not because of Bitcoin or Ethereum alone, it's because of real world asset tokenization. Now, this is a, uh, these are stats from Citigroup, right? That just got announced and um, they shared that all these big, nice numbers, right? Trillions and trillions of dollars in assets. No, I'm not here to pitch that. I'm here to explain that right now, already at least five and a half trillion in assets has been tokenized and more will come and it has to come. But here's the problem. That's step 10. We're at step one. What's actually missing? What is the real problem? It's custody. Right now, centralized custody has its problems. Decentralized custody has its issues as well. And the truth is it's broken. Just deleting a key and you lose 72 million uh, worth of assets and all that excess, right? You have customers saying, hey, I can't withdraw. And it's not right. And I'm sure all of you have had a horror story in crypto where someone messed up with their keys, lost a hard drive, a whole variety of problems. And we think that this cannot continue. Also, I see a lot of professionals in the room. So we spend a lot of time talking to professionals, fiduciaries, lawyers, um, accountants, wealth managers, and everyone has the same set of issues, which is first and foremost, single points of failure. Fundamentally, we, 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 we've thought that Bitcoin and, and digital assets are going to remove single points of failure. But then at the custody level, we start to generate them. Next, tools are very complex. Now, I know a lot of the early adopters, they're very technically savvy, they're very smart people. That's true. But there's also a reason why a lot of people, when they're not racing cars, they drive automatic cars because you don't want the headache. So the truth is that the lack, by removing complexity, we actually can improve a lot of stuff. Third thing is that it actually doesn't support professional workflows. A lot of the tools right now do not support the needs of professionals, fiduciaries who actually need this in their workflows and their compliance. So for example, right, what would you say if I told you a family office with significant digital holdings, they are securing it by having a single family member hold on to access that has no controls and no way of auditing what's actually happening. Do you think that's acceptable? Well, a lot of the professionals we talk to have a lot of problem with this as well. Insurers will not insure this. So that has to be solved. And of course, the last thing, cost. So naturally we want the lowest cost possible, right? So putting it this way, we know that everybody's not gonna compromise their security. No matter what, we always want something more secure. Mobile MPC, very easy to use, not secure enough. Centralized, okay, more secure, but then Obviously, it gets more complex, and by the time you reach multi-sig, very complex. So is there a way that we can move it out? Move it out to keep it simple to use, and yet still very secure. On the other side is the cost. We naturally want to bring costs as low as possible, 
mobile and PC, very cheap, but they're not very secure, and then it gets the other way. So the solution we come up with is called Totara. It's, the name Totara actually comes from a New Zealand tree that can live for a thousand years, and that's the value that we want to create. We want something that everyone can use and make this a human right. It's something that combines the best elements of multi-sig, of biometrics, of the on-chain auditability, and packages them in, into a set of trade-offs that we can accept. So Totara is what we call designated custody. Owners retain control all the time. It can be um, assigned out to, in, to individual professionals at, or at scale. So you could have a family office that's really small, or you can have multinational, multi-layered authorizations in the thousands. We built this so that if there were organizations, like say even a central bank who would need something that, that has ma many layers of authorizations, it could still work. It's built to scale. Digital signing, of course, I know we're meeting lawyers today, so this is one of the things. And of course, frictionless key rotations. So let me make that clear what it means. Frictionless in the sense that you don't have to keep bugging your client because you need to rotate your keys. On the professional side, whatever you need to do for your key management, you can rotate them without bugging the client and it will be done seamlessly in the back. Auditable and accountable. So it's on-chain, compliant with regulations, encrypted storage, for obviously for legal purposes. And one more important thing is, yes, if you need a separate instance of the data on your own service, Totara supports that. And lastly, incredibly affordable. Much, much more affordable than whatever solution is out there right now to have the, all these sets of features. And the reason why we care about this a lot is, again, we've set it up front, it has to be a human right. It's a problem we've thought about since the start of time, and we mean it. To us, this is very important that everybody has the right to use technology in this way. It should be seamless, it should be simple, it should be secure, it should be affordable. Our founders, uh, they unfortunately couldn't be here today, they are from New Zealand, uh, Paul Salisbury and Luke Ryan. So Paul has uh, easily 10, 15 years in the crypto space and he's been doing crypto audits for 10 years. A lot of the technology and the security that we see today is a result of what him and his team have been doing in the space. Luke Ryan is a registered CPA. He's handled a lot of m &A deals to the tune of you know, $5 billion. So he understands the need for custody and making sure that authorizations go according to plan because you don't want to have a problem with those deals. So both of them have combined their knowledge and built a team that is able to actually deliver on the promise of digital asset management for professionals. So who actually needs Sotara? Well, we want to talk to wealth managers, legal advisors, financial advisors, family officers, and basically anyone who gets a headache trying to manage their digital assets securely and, and trying to keep it all easy to use. So we would love to show you a demo if you're interested. We're going to have some beers as well. We can have discussions. Feel free to contact me. I'm Ruben at everlasting.io. And this is a QR code. It'll hit my email. Don't worry. I'm not going to be selling you a lot of weird stuff if you click this QR code, okay? With that, thank you so much for your attention and you know we'll catch up after this for beer. All right? Thanks so much, guys. <laughs>